إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله عز وجل كما جاء في محكم التنزيل يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون Dear brothers and sisters, we always begin with praise and gratitude. This is the essence of the reaction of one who has realized where did I come from? I have been blessed by the absolute truth of divine mercy to exist. And my whole existence is surrounded by favors and blessings. And so I owe a life of gratitude towards my beloved creator, provider, and sustainer. In this life, we have to rely upon the guidance that comes to us, lest our desires or ego fool us and lead us astray. So we bear witness that the one whom Allah guides uh, cannot be misguided. And anyone who has taken the path of misguidance, their heart is astray, and no one will find guidance for that heart until their heart turns back to its Lord. I bear witness that there is no deity and nothing worthy of worship other than God, and I bear witness that Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, was his final messenger he sent to mankind so that we could all realize ultimate divine compassion and mercy. The reality of our life is fluctuation of trial, calamity, and difficulty. This is the nature of life. And perhaps the most significant surah of the Qur'an that goes into great detail is Surah Yusuf alayhi salam. And so when we look at Surah Yusuf, we derive amazing, profound lessons that will teach us how to stay grounded in the prophetic mission. And so the beginning of Surah Yusuf starts out to give you the confidence you need as you go forward to shape and model your life according to the example of prophets, knowing what prophets will go through and what they will face. And anyone who believes in those prophets will find similar uh, reality. Begins the surah by saying we in the royal divine royal we. We are the ones or the one that is giving you this divine revelation. Revealing to you what you need to know that will give you stories and examples of the trials of life and the prophetic response in this book. Even though you, Muhammad وسلم, and your companions, the Arab people in Mecca, had no idea about these stories. Why is this a profound ayah? Number one, because Imam Qurtubi mentions in his tafsir that some Jews had talked with the Meccan people and they wanted to prove to these Quraysh that indeed he is a liar and that he's not a prophet. And so they came to the Prophet Muhammad and said, the most long and detailed layered story of our scripture in the Torah is the story of Joseph, alayhi salam, Yusuf. And so tell us about it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins to reveal to the Prophet وسلم, some portion of it. The next day the companions came to him as mentioned by Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas they said, we want more, you know, we're waiting for more. And then Allah reveals more and more until the whole, some 20 pages of the 12th chapter of the Holy Quran was revealed. Let's make sure that we contextualize what we're talking about here. The average person in America, if you said, okay, tell us about what you know about the religion of Islam. Tell us about a story from the life of the Prophet Muhammad. For example, right? 
Islam is a religion of maybe 7 million Americans. And you can see it here and there. It's here, right? But how many average Americans will be able to tell you one thorough story about the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Almost none of them. Now, in the time of the Prophet Muhammad in Mecca, how many people had learned the stories of the Jews? None of them. Why? Because the ayah says that. And the people of Quraysh were waiting to prove that the Prophet ﷺ is not a prophet, right? So if it says, you don't know anything about the life of Joseph in the Revelation, right? And he did know, and the Quraysh said, we've heard these stories, we know. You had access to these stories, then that would have made the Quran false, and nobody would believe it, because its knowledge is there. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu did not speak Hebrew. He did not read or write Arabic, right? And the Jews are not a missionary crowd. Jews are not a missionary religion. They don't go preaching about their religion. They keep it to themselves, right? And so the knowledge of the story of Joseph is not only not going to be with the Arabs, the common Jews might not know. I challenge you, for the Jewish friends that you know, to tell me, a uh, analysis of the story of Joseph today. Many of them will say, I have no idea. And then they say, aren't you Jewish? Do you believe in the Genesis, the first chapter of the Bible? They say, yeah. But, you know, I've heard something about it. He was in Egypt or something like that. That's how they will respond to you. Many of them. The devout ones will know. And that's because now we have the printing press. And everybody has a Bible. In the time of the Prophet Wasallam, there was no paper. They did not have a printing press. The Torah was not something people just had in their hands. So the fact that the Prophet is going to give every detail. Now if you compare the Bible and the Qur'an. Now the actual Bible that we have today is a response historically to the spread of a whole scripture known as the Holy Qur'an. Back then, everybody has some scriptures and I've got the, you know, he has one, he has that, he thinks that's authentic, he thinks this is, and there's no real official codified book that is established, right? So, this is an amazing point in the prophetic legacy of miraculous nature that if you read the many pages of the Bible about the story of Joseph, you will get almost 100% is the same. And the Prophet ﷺ had no access to that. Now you have confidence that the stories and the lessons you will learn are lessons that you should take very seriously and your soul is hanging in the balance. The first part of Surah Yusuf is a real believer is deeply concerned about the welfare of his or her children. That's the first thing we learn, right? That a believer is looking out for the harms that could present themselves to our children. I'll give you a couple examples that I know I'm very concerned about that I see there's very loose um, attitude in the Muslim community with it. And that is the access to uh, unadulterated technology. iPhones, iPads, computers for teenagers and even 10, 11 year old kids who all are very familiar with what Google does. And psychology would tell you that you should not give them this access at such a curious age. Hopefully they will grow and learn spirituality and an idea and then later we know many adults having a problem with this, right? So this is where we should not be giving our children unadulterated, unsupervised access to these things. The devil is in there in full force with influence. Second thing, who I would allow my children to have as close friends, right? Or people that they're around a lot. The way by which I would judge that is not, well, such and such friends are from our ethnicity, so therefore they must be okay. That is not correct. And you need to know, one of the things I've been addressing and I will continue to address is the unfortunate two-faced personality we have developed in our youth in the Muslim community where when they're around Mama and Baba or at the Islamic school 
They have a certain personality they've developed because they know what you expect. And then when they're <laughs> out there, because of the serious difference between the expectations and the two, and the lack of a founding of a universal identity that covers religion and culture as a multifaceted connected reality, they have a completely different personality and attitude over there. So we should be very careful with our children because as Yaqub, our great prophet, taught us, he was that very careful, concerned person. The third thing that we learn from our beloved forefather Yaqub, alayhi salam, Prophet Jacob, Israel, Jacob Israel is his name, is you should trust your gut feeling as a person who has been around prophethood, as a person who's taken in revelation, as a person of good knowledge, when you feel a deep concern in your gut that there is some problems coming, some very difficult reality that you believe is the best way to fix it is to take a different course, then you should trust that gut feeling. What are we talking about? We're talking about when the kids, the brothers of J uh, Yusuf, of our Prophet Joseph السلام, said, yeah, we're going to take Joseph, we're all going to go play. And then Jacob felt inside, I feel that you will go and you will get lost and the wolf will eat him. And they said, no, 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 trust me, don't worry, that's not going to happen. It won't happen like that, don't worry, trust us. And then they come back. Actually, we turned back and we saw that the wolf had ate him. Exactly as he thought what was going to happen. And that's why the Prophet said, Be conscious of and be careful of the gut feeling insight of the believer because they are looking with the light of God. Right? So we should trust that gut feeling when it comes. We learn from the brothers of Joseph the very serious evil of envy and how very crafty it can get. And so many people falsely dismiss the brothers of Joseph and say, oh, those are all evil, corrupt people. Well, guess what? Many of the great scholars of Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama'ah have said those were prophets. So said, آمَنَّا بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْنَا وَمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَعِيلَ وَإِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبَ وَالْأَسْبَاطُ What does the word asbat mean? These are the twelve tribes of Jacob. Meaning whom? The twelve children of Jacob, Yaqub a.s. Yusuf and his brothers. Now some scholars said, well no they're not prophets. It's just referring to which prophets would come from their progenies. Right? But still, they were righteous Muslims in general, children of a prophet. Why do I say that? Because Allah said in the Holy Quran, when He was on His deathbed, He asked them, "Mada ta'buduna min ba'di? What will you worship? What kind of believers will you be after me, my sons?" And they said, "Qalu na'budu ilaha ka wa ilaha abaika Ibrahim wa Ismail wa Ishaqa ilaha wahida wa nahnu lahu." Muslimun. We will worship your God, the God of Abraham, of Ismail, and uh, Jacob, and everyone, and, and Isaac, because that is the one God we've always known, and we will remain in submissive servitude to that God as Muslims, as believers. That's how they were when he died. So what we learn is even people of a very righteous upbringing, Prophet, how many of us are the children of prophets? None. So should any of us assume ourselves that never could I get envious and my envy start to create crafty plans to create problems for people? It could happen. I have unfortunately, as an imam for years now, seen many homes destroyed by envy. I've seen many lives and situations uh, destroyed by envy. And envy, as you see, you know, in the crafty story they brought, envy will pre present itself as something good. I have a good plan here. This is what we have to do. Save ourselves from this guy who's taking all of our stuff. Why? Because it's based in arrogance. This is 
mine, my right. We should be the one our father loves. We are better. He seems to get that. He shouldn't have it. Are these evil, terrible people that just, that's why they think like that? Or are they righteous people who are children of a prophet who fell victim to the devilish root of all evil when God said, this being Adam, bow down to him. A respected, noble future this being has. Iblis said, no. And what is Iblis at this point? Up until this point, he's a knowledgeable one who's been around for a long time. He's an elder amongst the angels. And he knows, and he's saying, I'm right, and my way, and my thinking, what I was created from, this one doesn't deserve any of that. Until today, he's stuck on that. It's a very dangerous disease that we should all protect ourselves from. We learn that prophets will always face opposition. And so if you're truly following the prophets, you will face opposition the odds will be stacked against you, right? It's a natural reality. Our sages, the scholars of our history, they said, if you aren't standing for anything, that is a sign, if, they said, if you are not being opposed by anyone, that is a sign you don't stand for anything. So you have to stand for something. You have to stand for the prophethood, for justice, for the right path. You have to be promoting Islam. If you find there's no problems in your life and everything's hunky-dory and simple and good, chances are you're not standing up for anything. And the interesting related one is Malcolm X al-Hajj Malik Shabazz, our great leader, Rahimullah Ta'ala, Rahmatan Wasqa. He said, if you don't stand for anything, then you will fall for anything. If you don't stand for something, you will fall for anything. Meaning what? You can become a puppet of someone else if you truly don't stand up for what you know is right. Other people can control you and you will just become like the foam on the ocean. This is the reality that we learn. This noble man and his wife, they found in the Bible story, it says that the Arabs, the Ishmaelites, were the ones who bought him or found him. And they sold him to what is named in the Bible Potiphar, the Aziz, the Egyptian man, a good merchant man, and his wife. And she says that he would maybe benefit us or we could treat him like a son. He will serve us. So he's just been bought as a slave. The next part of the ayah after he is bought as a slave, coming from a noble, righteous family and upbringing. And now he's been made a slave. And then Allah says, كَذَلِكَ مَكَّنَّا لِيُوسُفَ فِي الْأَرْضِ And like that, we have empowered and firmly rooted Joseph in the earth. Now you would think that the opposite is true. Because he just was made a slave. He's been made lower and weaker and lost power. Right? But Allah is teaching us a lesson about how prophethood uh, and its teachings and its followers will finally get their way. Brothers and sisters, it is a big blessing that Donald Trump and his crowd have become the president and having all of this power. So what did he just say? It is. Because if another liberal president comes in that's saying everything we want to hear, we're all hunky-dory, everything's fine in America, we all love each other, kumbaya, into the sunset, why all kind of corrupt, terrible things are happening behind the scenes and with the corrupt politics and capitalist consumerism that envelops our society, right? They would just go on like it's been our hamster wheel. Allah brought Donald Trump to bring you and I out of the hamster wheel to stand up for justice, to come to know who am I? What do I represent? Because I'm being challenged for who I am and what I stand for. People are saying what you stand for is no good. Do I know what I stand for? And I'm not going to stand for it, is the question I should ask myself now. And I'm being forced to ask that question because of this opposition. And what do the prophets do? Fortitude, perseverance. So it is our time to realize very sooner than later 
I'm going to be put into six feet deep with the worms as my companions. What was I doing in this earth? What was my purpose? What did I do to promote that purpose? Was it to go to America so that I could have a, a good life with money and feel comfortable and all of that? Or was it about promoting the Word of God in my life and in my words and in my deeds and in my family and in my community? So that is what we learn in that lesson. The next lesson we learn is that desires are real. Every person is tested and born with certain desires that have legislated religious teachings of how to properly take care of those and how to enjoy those and there is a tendency for one to go overboard in it. They are very real and you should never let your guard down. Religious law is not just some rules that they have, some book or some religion my family's trying to force me to follow. The laws of God are there to protect your soul, to protect you from becoming an animal, to make you an elevated human on an angelic and even higher than the angelic reality because you're choosing it while they do it by natural response to divine command. You see, when it says in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ هَمَّتْ بِهَا وَهَمَّ بِهَا لَوْلَا أَرْرَآ بُرْهَانَ رَبِّي A lot of common Muslims don't know what almost all, I'm going to say all of the tafsirs from the Sahaba and the Tabi'een say what happened was is that they were in some area alone which the Prophet ﷺ prohibited us from deciding to be alone with a non-mahram. Yusuf is a slave and he's kind of forced in this situation, alayhi salatu And all of the mufassirin say, she starts to talk to him and incite him and they start to get into a heated type of thing until he saw a vision of his father telling him no. And he remembered what he had been raised on in Revelation and he pushed away and started to run away from her. And then she pulled him and he went out the door saying, this is what happened. What do we learn from this? We learn that a prophet is a human being and will have thoughts just like we have. But in the prophets is the example that we do not follow those thoughts. We reject them. We seek to run away from them. We seek to replace them with that which is better. <coughs> this is who are we to say, oh, well, you know, in the modern world, we just work together in the office, so it's natural she comes in here and, you know, work hours are over. No, 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 no. There is no reason why any devout, real believer in Islam would be alone with someone from the opposite gender that is not from their family. And if you're going to interact with someone on a regular basis, it would be a disaster if you said, well, you know, it's just a handshake. It's just a, a little innocent hug, right? You see this. A believer will set the stage in a respectful, honorable way that explains a simple statement about modesty and chastity as cornerstones of our faith. And so if you'll please allow me to respect your space so that we can respect each other's space and not have these interactions. Now somebody says, but well, Imam, I have been working where I work for 20 years. It's going to be kind of awkward if I didn't. No, no, no. It's called toba. It's called standing up for what you know is right. Why? Because I said so. It's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He taught that. Right? And so we should follow that. Because Yusuf is better than all of us here put together. All our Iman together is not there with Yusuf. And Shaitan was getting to him until Allah blessed him with the reminder. And that's the second thing that we learn about the story. Yusuf is rooted in prophethood. He is someone who has learned and reflected and prayed and he was deeply connected. It wasn't a one day of a week Islam for him. So therefore when that situation arises, when Shaitan is bringing the heat, he can easily be reminded. But if he's just not really embracing the faith as a lifetime identifying reality, 
core part of who I am, then he would have fell victim as many of us would have. So this is what we learn from that one. The next thing we learn is a beautiful point about justice. So when he comes out, he says, look, she's coming after me and she's tried to do it and I'm not with that. It's unacceptable. I'm a man of God and so forth. Her family is all there. And they say, well, look at this slave lost his way. You know, the wife of Aziz here, we trust her because of affiliation. What was shahida shahidun min ahlihi? Min ahliha. So the witness came up and he said, hold on. Yes, we're all family here. We know her. She's a good woman. But we have to look into all of the evidence before we jump to a conclusion about what we're being told is what's going on and make sure we study it really well before we bring down a harsh decision on this slave boy. And he said, let's look at this evidence. And this is the Qur'anic. We don't say, oh, well, because this is my family, so I'm going to side with them. Or this is my buddy from a long time. Or this one's from my ethnicity or my religion. So therefore, I'm with them and I, I, I will trust them and not believe them. A Muslim is not like that. And then the last thing that we learn is seeing the big picture. <laughs> oh my Lord, I would rather go to the prison what his wife to try to make herself look innocent brought all of these beautiful women and they suggested something that a normal man will be gravitating towards responding to that. It's, it's built into us. The believer says, look, yeah, right now, that would be awesome. And maybe I could repent later. Like the mistaken understanding of the brothers of Joseph. They said, well, after that, we will be salihin after we do this. No. You have to see the big picture. Yeah, I might have to go to jail. I might have to go through some difficulties right now because I'm rejecting this thing that seems like it's really desirable. But what will come later is best for me if I go through these difficulties right now. So we learn to see the bigger picture and to look far, not just for the immediate benefit, but for the far benefit and the bigger picture. We ask Allah to guide us and forgive us and make us of those who hear the word and follow. We always uh, read the Qur'an and think and ponder and contemplate. That's the attitude of a believer. Surah Yusuf, it, we in our context today need to be reading this surah a lot because it will help guide us through what we're going through as a people. And so we learn various lessons. We see the evidence of this being the book of God. We see the example of prophethood and how to respond to adversity and difficulty and hardship. So we ask Allah, Ya Allah, make us those who ponder over the Holy Qur'an. Ya Allah, make us be Muslims day and night, glorify and exalting your greatness, seeking the knowledge of your Holy Book. Ya Allah, please guide us to be people who hear the guidance from your scripture and follow it. Ya Allah, we ask you to make us a people who are genuinely, sincerely looking to live for your will. Ya Allah, help us to realize when evil and envy and corruption is around us and protect us from it. Ya Allah, give us signs as you gave Yusuf the signs so that we could see our way out. Ya Allah, help us to be those who are deserving of your contentment and your support and your ultimate presence and eternity. Ya Allah, we ask you to forgive us for our laziness, for our shortcomings, for our weakness, for our lack of knowledge and understanding. Ya Allah, we ask you to emphasize in us all of the beautiful qualities and traits of prophethood. We ask you to make us of those who stand for justice and righteousness and modesty and chastity and prophetic legacy. Ya Allah, send your peace and blessings and mercy on your final messenger, Muhammad.